Hi there, friends and enemies. It is Chesera reporting to you from the war zone that is South Africa. Used to be a prosperous and peaceful country. And um, now I'm sitting over here waiting to be raped, tortured, genocided, murdered, praying for a bullet rather than a slow death. And yeah, I say that for real because you want to look at how people that we've burned in the sun are being killed off here. And um, a lot of other people as well. Uh, uh, but I'll, I will give you another video why I say it is a white genocide in particular. This is not exactly what I want to deal with. What I want to do is warn the West that communism kills. And so that we are all on the same page. What I mean by communism <laughs> is the whole in the whole basket of leftism, whether you say Marxism or um, socialism or Trotskyite, that's probably an inflamed, more bloodthirsty version of communism and Marxism, if that is possible. Any of these things left, what you mean is poison. It is either slow poison, which is socialism, slowly poison the well with a drop of arsenic and another drop and another drop and another drop and um, over time you kill the people or you do it the quick way you just throw a whole lot of arsenic in the well as they did in Russia with the red Bolsheviks and you want to see how many millions of Russians were killed during that revolution so that the communists could take hold. This is Africa, obviously, but I don't want you to look at it as Africa. I want you to look at it as though it's Europe. Just pretend this is Italy, this is Germany, this is, you know, Scandinavia, just, just because it's coming to the same thing. You, the slow poison is already working on you. So we've had the relatively quick poison, although it's taken a while to filter down. You are getting the super slow uh, version. But once it starts to unravel, I guarantee you, it will happen so fast, you won't even know what hit you. Why am I blaming communism in particular? Oh, and what do I mean by communism? So we're all on the same page. Yes, I, I have read uh, the Marxist literature. If you'd like me to photograph my shelves and shelves. And I have actually gotten rid of a lot of my collection because I just don't have room for it. Oh yes, Marx, Engels, that, 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 I've read it. And here is what Marxism is. It's feudalism, feudalism. For those of you leftists who uh, don't have the vocabulary and those of you sane people who uh, have not been exposed to the word because common core feudalism is the old system in Europe whereby you would have a lord of the manor and then he would parcel out the land to his serfs and they would work the land and they would um, pay him taxes for the right to you know live on his land and they would all obey him he was a central authority no body would dare speak up against him. So everyone of the serfs was equally poor and miserable, uh, just as people in communist countries are. And uh, the Lord of the Manor, which is now the state and the corporates, are in charge. And that is what communism has done. It has delivered Africa into the hands of the most enormous corporates. And they are now the Lord of the Manor. And the situation for ordinary Africans is catastrophic. There is where there was once hope, there was no hope. So how did this happen? Okay, bear with me. I am going to get to exactly how uh, the communists infiltrated and so on. First word, uh, first person interviews and so on, I'm going to get that. But I need to acquaint you with the lay of the land, because if you aren't from this region, you won't know. 
So this is Africa, right? Europe is just up there. China, India is this side. Russia is way over there. And the United States is over the pond over here. And when you get to here, this is South America over the pond over here. And um, so obviously this was all under colonialist oppression. These are different countries with different colonies and different histories. So back up. South Africa was a British colony. Mozambique was a Portuguese colony, as was Angola. Namibia was a German colony. Not going to go into all of these countries. Yes, I know them all. By the way, that is Angola. The capital is Luanda. Zambia, Lusaka. Malawi, Lilongwe. Zimbabwe, Harare. Mozambique, Maputo. South Africa, Pretoria. Cape Town, now the violent capital of South Africa, roadblocks. Property prices have tanked, they have fallen disastrously. And Botswana, Gaborone, and Namibia, Vint Hook. It means windy corner. And if you want to argue with me on any of these subjects, you best be very well acquainted with local history because I have lived here all my life and I have a family growing from west coast to the east coast and friends from all over <coughs> so okay where was I sorry coughing um yeah uh, aunt born here or friends from school over here know a lot of refugees from this area. I was born here in Namibia before it became Namibia. That's the name since independence. Before that, it was a protectorate of South Africa and it was known as Southwest Africa. My father was born here. My cousins were born in Mozambique. My other cousins grew up in Swaziland. I lived in Durban on the east coast for a long time. Uh, my ancestors, French refugees, note, not colonizers, uh, started out in Cape Town. And okay, this area was prosperous. Under colonialism, it was prosperous. I'm not apologizing for colonialism or for apartheid. I don't, I don't like the idea of invasion or oppression I extremely dislike the old um, apartheid regime. My family was politically persecuted. And I have nothing good to say about them. What I don't like and what I do like does not matter. I don't like being a person who gets sick a lot. But guess what? I don't have a choice. So this is not about my likes and dislikes. This is simple reality. And it's not about your likes and dislikes either. I'm simply laying out to you what happens when you infiltrate a region with communism. Again, I'm going to stick to this area over here because I know it best. Born here, used to go to Angola often as a young child beautiful country. Um, yeah, this is my neck of the woods. That's the South Atlantic Ocean. That's the Indian Ocean. If you go further, you get to India. And if you go south, it's Antarctica. So there is no more south to go. Now, slowly from the 1960s, this region went from stable and started to horribly unravel because communism and let me show you what I mean by stable. This is a Mozambique in the 70s. Yep, yeah, that's Portuguese. It was a Portuguese colony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't perfect. I mean, it was a colonialist country. However, people were not starving. Infrastructure was being laid down and built. Uh, education was going up. 
Okay, everybody, sorry, I had to take a break over there because a friend of mine who lives close to me in a place called Mulder's Drift, she is specifically in Copper's Dr uh, Copper House, uh, called me in an emergency situation. Uh, this was the security alert she received. I'm going to play it for you. Somebody trying to break in at cottage number five on plot number 97, Copper House. Okay, so she's in... Uh, House number, cottage number seven, and number five is uh, being broken into. Apparently security was on the way, and I'm waiting to hear from her. I assume all is well for now. Yeah, so to get back to Mozambique, let us refresh our memories. This is Mozambique over here. I live in South Africa. This is Mozambique. This was the capital of Mozambique back in the good old days of colonialism. Portuguese colonialist regime. It looked like this. Lots of, it looks very European, uh, very South American, very Portuguese, very Spanish, that type of thing. Now, if you want to, If you want to decolonize Mozambique, you have to do a lot more than change the name from uh, Lorenzo Marx, name of the capital from Lo Lorenzo Marx to Maputo. You have to take down all these structures. You have to take away the roads. You have to take away the electricity. You have to take away the hotels. You have to take everything away and leave it back in its pristine state that it was in before. And no, I don't think that's the worst idea under the sun because personally I have great respect uh, for tribal cultures. I, I have lived in Africa in lots of different places. I've been exposed to very many different groups. There are 11 languages in South Africa alone to give you an idea of how diverse the population really is. And um, I, I, I dispute that their way of life prior to the colonialists arriving here was any, any worse because if you're sitting in a high rise building and you have a great big car and you are wealthy beyond words and you commit suicide because you are so unhappy, it comes down to quality of life. So, yeah, personally for me, uh, I like a simple life. But here's the thing, the people who want decolonization, they're going to have to do a lot more than slit a few more white throats and spill and sacrifice a little bit more white blood. They're going to have to rip it all up. So you have to make a choice about what you want. Okay, so here we have Mozambique under colonialism. What does Mozambique look like now since this war of liberation slash communism? Let's take a look. Uh, here we go. 10 shocking facts about poverty. Although Mozambique has made considerable progress in reducing poverty, that is a lie. It has increased in poverty ever since so-called liberation. And those people who say, oh, there are people being uplifted from poverty every single day, so many millions. Yeah, you're not talking about the people who are being <laughs> put back into poverty, are you? So you're lying, you're spreading lies about what the world is really like. And by the way, just for context, so that, that's the globe, that's Africa. Oh, and there's Russia over there. How did it get here? Apologies to my Russian friends. I know you say Soviets and you make a distinction between the USSR and today. Listen, we were a third world backwater. We just knew it as the Russians and the Reds and the communists. So how did they get from here to there? We are going to address that. Anyway, we $2 a day, they're living on $2 a day. You must be joking. $3 a day is about my food alarms. <laughs> That's extravagant. They're not living on $2 a day. They're living on much less. Oh, and I'm not kidding about that. That is literally what I live on because I have medical bills. 
and I have to keep a roof over my head. So let us look at the Civil War in Mozambique. Infrastructure was destroyed, oh you bet, never been fixed. Six million people were displaced and as many as one million deaths were reported. Extreme climate conditions, floods, droughts, yeah. Listen, throughout Portuguese colonialism, this happened. It's a tropical area. This is perfectly normal. It is not unusual. They, they put in safeguards and they managed to pull up from these situations. It is not new. It is not climate change. It is not anything. This is the way it is. What did all these six million people be displaced, uh, displaced and uh, all these people die for? so that Mozambique can rank. This is out of 187 countries, 187 is the poorest, they are number 181. How lovely. What a liberation. Yep, education is only 47%. Again, during colonialism, there was this thing called hope. Education was going up. Yes, bad things were happening, but you can't deny that there were other gains being made that have been lost. And now there is no hope. 42% of deaths among children, malaria, mm -hmm. highest prevale uh, prevalence of HIV in the world. Yeah, that, that would be all the countries in this region are in this group. One in every five children are severely deprived of education. Almost one third of the population suffers from malnutrition. And one in every five children is severely nutritionally deprived. 43% of children under five suffer from malnutrition. And half the population of Mozambique does not have access to clean water. 17% of children under five die. Life expectancy is only 55 years. Again, under the Portuguese colonialist regime, which is not a question of whether I like it or not. Again, it is simply what it was. Life expectancy was going up. Infant mortality was going down. Education was going up. Sanitation was going up. Since liberation, this is where we are now. So if you think that's a success, good on you. I think it is horrendous. And uh, you care about ideology. I care about human beings. I am not a white person. I am not anything. I am a human being, as is everybody else on this continent and everywhere else on this planet. So we are now going to go and look back at our map. And where are we now? Let's take a look at Zimbabwe, the previous Rhodesia. Rhodesia named after Cecil John Rhodes. Yes, he was a nasty man. I couldn't agree more. He gave his name to Rhodesia. He was a high colonist of the greatest order. And yeah, the Rhodes Scholarship yeah, in the United Kingdom, I think it's at Oxford specifically, Oxford or Cambridge, but I think it's Oxford. It's named after him. Recipients include Bill Clinton and so on. So his legacy keeps going. Uh, the country was handed, it was given independence and it was handed to a liberation black government, black majority rule. I have no problem with that in principle. But here is what Zimbabwe looked like before. Mm. Zimbabwe was called the breadbasket of Africa. It is one of the most fertile regions in all of Africa. Very easy to grow. South Africa, largely arid, desert, not so easy to grow in. Zimbabwe, very fertile. It was a wealthy, wealthy country. There were, there were uh, um, schools being built, progress being made, uh, lots of things were going up. There was this thing called hope. 
okay? And what, that is Robert Mugabe, who everybody rejoiced when he was voted into power. And when people who knew better said, look, he was already starting to genocide the Indabele. Just to be clear, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe is roughly divided into two tribes, the Shona, which is the dominant majority tribe, and the Ndebele. And Mugabe is a Shona. So uh, there were factions that were looking for leadership in the country, and that included Joshua Nkomo, a true hero of Africa, who uh, represented the Ndebele. They lost. Nkomo stood down to prevent more violence, and Mugabe continued rampaging through and killed something like 20,000 Ndebele in Masbili land, while the world looked away, and if anybody said this was happening, you were called racist and told it was because you were trying to tarnish the name of the new hope of Africa, which is Robert Mugabe. We all know how that's worked out, don't we? Yes, he was allegedly, you know, they, they just basically shifted him over. It's still a one party state. And let's have a look at the breadbasket of Africa today. And I want to weep when I see this because I know people in Zimbabwe, I have tried to raise funds for water pumps and so on for their villages. And yeah. So uh, the UN Food Agency on Tuesday launched a $331 million appeal for aid donations to feed millions of people in crisis hit Zimbabwe, which is reeling from a drought and the high cost of food. Mm, 5 million people, or one third of, of the 16 million Zimbabweans, are in dire need of aid and at least half of them on the cusp of starvation. I know if you're liberal, you do not know what starvation looks like. So let me show you the face of starvation. Grace yourselves, my sweetie darlings, because trigger warning if this is very unpleasant, but you can't say it is so unpleasant because this was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. So let us go and notice I'm using mainstream sources because I don't want anybody to say I'm spreading false news. So yes, the sources may be right, they may be wrong, but I am looking for mainstream and original sources. This is what starvation looks like. See this poor little child. And uh, this photograph has haunted me since I saw it in 1994, I think was when Kevin Carter, the photojournalist, won the Pulitzer Prize for taking it. The famine in Sudan. No, it's not set up. That is a vulture stalking a baby. A baby dying of starvation. See the thin little arms and legs, the big belly, his little head, his little head in the sand. It ended just as you think it would. People say, well, why didn't Kevin Carter rescue him? Why didn't he rescue him? Okay, let me explain this to you again. Would you like to parachute yourselves in to Zimbabwe <clears throat> and rescue five a million people? Because that's what it looked like around him. You can't rescue one. There's millions of people in the same position. When photojournalists were allowed into this area, it was on the precondition that they touched nothing and no one. And there's several reasons for this. First of all, being vectors for disease to a vulnerable population. Um, the fears that they might, might cause a stampede among starving people. Yeah, so he was subject to conditions and so was everyone else who went in. Yes, aid was allegedly pouring in, but it was being stolen and distributed on the black market. So warlords were taking it, it was never reaching the people. And I don't know what kind of a person or what kind of a human being would ever risk this situation again. 
And this is what the entire Southern Africa is facing. Famine. Terrible famine. And Kevin Carter, South African, was, um, he committed suicide. So, you know, winning Pulitzer Prizes isn't enough. If you think this is an awful photograph, go and look at the rest of the photographs. They couldn't have used them because they are so god awful to look at. He committed suicide. Um, uh, they were called the Bang Bang Club because these photojournalists would go into every single the most dangerous areas, uh, the most uh, deprived areas to document life. And someone I know uh, knew uh, Kevin Carter and bumped into him shortly before he took his own life, said he was a hollowed up shell of a man. So yes, this is famine, and this is what you are wishing on this region. Because this drought extends from here, up Namibia, to southern Angola. Okay, And these countries have been relying on South Africa for food. But South Africa is killing farmers who burn in the sun. So food production has gone steadily down. Cost of living has gone up. More farmers are being killed every day. There were three farm attacks, I think a day or so ago, one day. There are only 30,000 farmers left, if that many. So starvation, this is what communism brings. Not convinced? Let me take you on over to the next place. Let us have a look at Angola. Portuguese colony, Portuguese colony. Um, Angola is one of the richest countries in the world, okay? Because it has massive oil reserves, great resources, amazing resources. It should be a wealthy, thriving country. A liberation or no liberation but it's been liberated into the hands of the corporates. And so there is a very rich class of people. And then we have the serfs, the poor people on the feudal ground, and they are starving. And they have been starving for a very long time. Millions struggle for food, yes. Oh, by the way, um, never, never close off ads. There's a reason I don't close off ads. How the hell do you think these websites earn money? Hmm? You, know, you think you just get this put up for free and then you take away the web, uh, the ads and they miraculously suck in money out of the ether. No, they don't. I know I have websites myself. If you uh, are not a leftist, you don't want things for free, do you? You don't want to steal things. Turn off the bloody ad blocker, suck it up. It's payment. And you get pennies, you get pennies for these ads. So remember that the next time you uh, complain about adverts on websites. According to UNICEF, recent rainfall in Angola has been erratic and below what is expected. Uh, Pre uh, President Lorenzo declared in a state of emergency and acknowledges that the people need help. You bet they do. But yeah, let's take a look at, oh no, sorry, it's mm, Angola in the 1950s. This is under the Portuguese colonialist regime. This is a silent film. It's just to give you the briefest idea. Yeah, buildings going up, infrastructure going up. Not a perfect country, a country that was deprived and unequal in many ways. But, you know, it worked, yes. There we have people who burn in the sun. And if we go on a little bit further, those people who burn in the sun, you see them talking very comfortably to locals. Those are called Wattos, by the way. They carved out canoes and we used to go from Namibia across to Angola in them. So yes, this is a world I remember very well, and I have a great fondness for Angolans, the people. Okay, here we go, beautiful. 
Yeah, we have people, and that, that was normal. Yeah, people would be chatting and holding babies like this and so on. It was completely normal. It was much, it was oppressive, but it was much less obnoxious than people imagine today. There was a great um, sense of, well, you know, we're all in it together. I'm not saying there weren't absolute monsters who were whites. Obviously there were. We are not living in delusional la-la land. I'm simply saying that there was far more friendship and cooperation than anyone seems to uh, uh, remember, or perhaps they never knew, which is why I'm trying to educate you. And then a liberation came. And let's make the point, Marxist, communist, revolution. Oh, and... Um, Wait, yeah, please, you have to bear with me because if I don't do it this way, I'm going to have people turning around and saying to me, oh, you you, you, you make it up or conspiracy theory or so. Yeah, oh, look, uh, the machete and, and the sickle, uh, how very communist. Yeah, so this was a communist. It was a, a revolution of uh, the left. It was a liberation movement and it resulted in disaster and prices are similar to Hong Kong. It has got the greatest divide between rich and poor. And that is what I mean by communism delivers you into the hands of the corporatocracy, corporatocracy, rotocracy, I, uh, you know, the kleptocracy. That is the, the net result. And now the people have no hope and they are serfs on their own land. They have no representation because big corporates own them. And these big corporates, they want this region to starve. They want this region to starve because there are plenty of things which I will go into that they can use to profit from all of this. Wars are always profitable to somebody and never to the victims involved. Okay, so that's Angolia, Angola. Angola. And then we go to my homeland where I was born which was part of South Africa then, Namibia. Okay, here is, I was born here, very close to the border of Angola. And that's why I know about those watos, that's what we call them anyway, that he used to row across the river to get to Angola. We used to visit there a lot. Beautiful, beautiful country, beautiful people, all of them, of every, of every hue. And then, the liberation, the communists came, and I will show you shortly how that happened in another video. They came and there was a war along this border, okay? And this was where, when I was growing up. I was actually caught in a skirmish in Angola when I was a young child and we barely made it back across. Only thanks to the captains of the Watto canoes who risked to their own lives. So yes, I am extremely compassionate with Angolans and the way they are treated in South Africa, the way refugees from all these countries are treated is appalling. Google xenophobic violence and see how terrible the abuse of the black on black violence, as it were, is towards refugees from the rest of Africa. So yeah, uh, this war of liberation over here, South African troops, were set up to defend the border because that was then still a protectorate of South Africa. And Russians came down and trained the Angolans and they pulled in troops from all over Africa to storm the borders. And well, the net result was a liberation and a deliverance into poverty. Or Namibia too, because Namibia it's a desert. Let's have a look at Namibia. Mm. Mm. Devastating drought. And they blame climate change. No, 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 no. I, I grew up, I grew up in Namibia on a farm and it's very arid. Half of Namibia is, um, oh, 
It's a desert. Look it up. It's the Nama Desert. It's a complete desert, and the rest of it is extremely arid. It's a tiny proportion of the land compared to the rest that is actually arable. And yes, there were always droughts. I grew up in droughts, and I've seen herds of bucks starving, uh, their ribs sticking out, dying of dehydration. It's terrible. It's a terrible sight. But that is a desert, and that is reality. And so this is not oh, oh, suddenly because something happened. Uh, it is because, um, yeah, it's because that is the climate over there. 500,000 Namibians face food insecurity. Within six months, an estimated 60,000 head of cattle will have starved due to inadequate grazing. I, I have seen this firsthand growing up there. Uh, I remember people had to cull, they had to cull heavily uh, to protect the few that were, you know, remaining, get them enough food and water. Now, 500,000 Namibians doesn't sound like a lot. This is one of the countries with the lowest uh, populations in the world, something like 2 million. But so, you work it out, you work it out what is happening over here. So, um, yeah. And now there's a drought in Southern Africa as well. The liberation has filtered down all these countries that I've shown you. And there is a mighty civil war being waged over here so that we can go the same route. And I want you to remember that these countries are dependent on South African electricity food and infrastructure, ports, they are all dependent on South Africa. So when South Africa falls and it's falling catastrophically quickly, this entire region is going to starve. Again, let me remind you what starvation looks like. This is the face of famine. Thank you and I will see you in the next video.